welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Charles Jones of Charles Jones Blades. A viewer recently reached out to me and suggested I would like Charles's work and one look at his Instagram and website told me that that viewer was absolutely correct. Hunters, Bowies, Kukri's short and not so short swords are the Charles Jones blades that jump out at me the most, but his full custom orders also show an exciting variety of inspirations and capabilities as a knife maker. Charles has a, uh, got a very early start in knife making. We're talking preteen. Uh, which I have some understanding of right now, uh, making his first knife with very simple tools. Now he makes each blade entirely by hand and in-house using a variety of steels and heat treatments. We'll let Charles get into that and tell us all about his blades and how he makes them. Uh, but first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download the show to your favorite podcast app. And if you'd like to help support the show, quickest and best way to do that is on patreon you can go over to the knifejunkie.com slash patreon and check out what we have to offer again that's the knifejunkie.com slash patreon do you carry multiple knives then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up you're a knife junkie of the first order charles welcome to the show uh, well, it's uh, really nice to have you, and it's kind of cool how you came to me because I, uh, I, you know, I'm I'm constantly scrolling for new makers, and uh, this time someone reached out to me and said, "Bob, I know your taste. You got to check this guy out." Um, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it was it was uh, pretty exciting. I uh, kind of have like a little YouTube thing. I uh, post on Instagram every once in a while, but uh, really. Uh, I don't get to go to a lot of the shows. I'm a little too busy for that at this point. So it's really cool to, you know, be on the show and be able to showcase some stuff. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks for coming. And let's let's get right into it. Uh, tell me a little bit. I, I gave a tease in the in the intro, but tell me a little bit about what you make and, and what your philosophy is. Well, my philosophy was when I was growing up, I was really interested in like anthropology. Like, you know, what did humans do in the past? And so I kind of like making everything. Uh, I, I've done little knives, big knives, axes. If I can forge it, then uh, then I make it. I even uh, made myself a custom uh, like sword heat treat oven. So I could heat treat like up to like 60 inches myself, which makes, you know, large blades a lot easier. Uh, but really, it's just it's the challenge of building something, no matter the size, just kind of gets me. All right, so you're a maker. You're a, you've got that creative uh, 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 seed at, at your core. How did you make your first knife? And uh, yeah, what was that process like? Yeah, the first one. Um, my growing up, my father did the occasional like uh, like artistic blacksmith work. He do like the you know the twisted iron bars. He did some uh, with a like candle holders and just things like that. And I always thought it was pretty cool. Um, and uh, one time I was like thirteen, like twelve or thirteen. And I found a little piece of steel in his garage that wasn't quite knife shaped, but it was somewhat close. And I was like, I want to make a knife because he had made a couple knives, but primarily he did the the iron work. Um, and so he gave me a file and. I was like, all right, here's a here's a book on knife making, and uh, read half the book and just started filing away, and uh, it didn't turn out very well, but I, I still have it somewhere. I gotta say, uh, Charles, maybe this is tr in true male fashion, or maybe it's just uh, I might have a similar mind. But I like how you said you read half the book. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, all right, let, let's just do this. Let's embark yeah. on this. Um, so a file and a, and a piece of steel I saw on your website, 5160 steel mm -hmm. and, and a file. What's it like yep. making a knife using a file? Um, it takes more time to make the knife with the file than it did to read that giant book. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the piece of steel, I, it was like a leaf spring. So it was either like 5160 or 
like the 92 series of steels, they use that, that spring steel. Uh, but it wasn't annealed. It, it wasn't fully hardened, but it was not annealed. So it was lots of scraping and scraping. And uh, finally, after I think a week of working on it, like every day after school, I had something that kind of resembled a knife. Well, to me, that's uh, that's got to be a good test as to whether uh, this is uh, something you actually want to do or something that you're actually fascinated with. Because for a 12 year old boy, that could that could be the start of something beautiful mm -hmm. or the or the absolute end. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and growing up, I I always just had this interest in like how people did things in the past. And in our backyard, we had these. Uh, we'd find these stones and there were obsidian inclusions in them and so mm -hmm. i'd get a hammer out of the garage when i was like 10 and start knocking the obsidian out of it and start making flakes i made a couple of spearheads and that was you know super fun and just always kind of like sharp things uh you're talking about um fascination with how people did things in the past what yeah where where do you think that comes from i mean you were saying that your dad blacksmithed um mm -hmm. And uh, what, was it maybe some of that or? I think that had an influence on it. Um, another thing was he was a really big movie buff. So like getting to watch, you know, all of the, the movies about the past, you know, you see things like a glass of the Mohicans, you know, was a great one when I was a kid. And I always just loved how intricate things were back then. Mm -hmm. You have like, you know, an intricate beadwork on everybody's knife or you have, you know, something that's absolutely one of a kind piece that you don't really see nowadays. I mean, you go to Walmart and pick up, you know, uh, what did a, you know, there's a million of the same knife. Yeah. And uh, I, I like, I like things being a little more personal than, you know, mass production for everything. That intricate thing that you're talking about that quality of intricacy that you see in old work um uh my family and i were visiting a cathedral not too long ago and mm. uh i mean every square inch on this place uh they just don't do this anymore but everything no. was carved stone little mm -hmm. flowers and crosses and pooty figures and angels everywhere it must have taken you know, thousands of men, I know it took like 300 years. So um, to me, uh, that is mind blowing that, yeah. that at one time there was that attention to detail. You still find it nowadays. It's just, uh, it's not as mainstream. So, okay. You, you start making knives, you make mm -hmm. your first knife from a file <clears throat> and an old piece of spring steel. How did, how did it go from there? Did you immediately immerse yourself or was it the sort of, uh, like a reoccurring dalliance until you 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 dipped in fully. Um, after that, you know, I uh, went through high school and I did the occasional project. Um, now most of them weren't knife related. Uh, I really liked carving wood, so I'd carve you know walking sticks and stuff. Uh, but I went through high school, did some college, you know, had to go to work. Uh, I worked as uh, worked for it was like AT and T on the phone for a few years and I worked for a health or health insurance company for a few years and that it wasn't very fun. Um, and then after, after that, it was 2017, I, I got laid off from that job and I was like really broke and it was my oldest son's birthday. And I was like, you know, it's turning like eight, I can make him a little knife. So I went out to the garage and, you know, made just a really simple little knife. And I showed some pictures to some people and there were people who wanted some. So I started being like, you know, maybe, maybe I should, you know, really immerse myself and start making things that I didn't think I'd ever be able to make at first. But now it's like, it's actually, you know, quite a, quite uh, happy with kind of the direction I took my knives of like seeing like Damascus and being like, I got to find, I got to figure out how to make that. I got to, I got to practice forging knives. And then went on YouTube and watched a whole bunch of videos, bought some books and just really kind of immersed myself and kind of accidentally started a business. Oh man. I love that. Well, <clears throat> I mean, it's, I, I, uh, I had a, 
a girlfriend right out, out of college who actually who who worked the phones at AT and T. She worked her way up over the years. And I, I know that also. But uh, man, talk about that! Like that was like the most corporate. Like whenever I went to visit her at her office or met her friends like the most corporate it gets. And that is not uh, a judgment. It's just an observation. Mm -hmm. And, and now, and now I look at, at uh, what the lifestyle of being a knife maker uh, must be like, not just the lifestyle, that's just the window dressing, but what the, the difference in the levels of fulfillment must be uh, mm -hmm. like, how, how do you contrast that? Um, I guess I would describe it as like, you know, if you're doing a painting, you know, corporate life is very like straight lines. Everything's very like boxy, uh, very modern, uh, limited color palette. But then you go into like, you know, knife making or even if it's, you know, something else that you're really, really passionate about. It's like all of a sudden you're painting, you know, beautiful landscapes and things that you didn't think you'd ever really be able to do. And things are much brighter and more vibrant. They can be more challenging at times, but, uh, definitely when you step back and look at the fuller picture it's just a lot more life in the you know doing things yourself yeah yeah that that uh corporate uh straight edge and muted color palette and that kind of thing it's like it's like uh it it's 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 like it's engineered to bring everyone to the same level mm -hmm. you know yeah we're not happy we're not sad we're not satisfied we're not unsatisfied yeah and uh taking that shift. All right. You're totally inspiring me. And I'm sure many others, because uh, a lot of people start off in office jobs and they end up in office jobs, even when they don't necessarily want to be there. So there is life after that. If, uh, if you're perseverant enough, and I want to get to that, what the, what perseverance it takes to, to do the job you're doing now, but tell me about that uh, knife you first made for your son. And I love that story. It's a, it's a beautiful story. You know, and uh, he'll always have and cherish that knife, uh, no doubt. But, but tell me about the knife and what was it that drew other people to it? That one, it was actually really, really simplistic. It was uh, it was just another piece of spring steel. Uh, this one was a bit thinner, uh, so I didn't have to do a lot of uh, like forging to it. But I kind of you know, shaped the tip in a little bit. And then I got to work with a couple of just like sanders that I had in the garage. And... Uh, it doesn't exactly have a bevel. I, at that point, hadn't, you know, figured out how to dial in bevels and, you know, plunge lines and all that. So it doesn't have a bevel, but it's just a very simplistic little knife, about that long. Good enough for, you know, carving. has a smaller-ish handle on it that I think was some kind of pine that I had out in the garage. And uh, I, I used uh, bolts as the handle pins and just ground off the, uh, the threading. And just put those in there and finish the handle. Very, very simple. But um, I don't really know what drew people to it. Uh, I think it was just that uh, well, I hand sanded the whole thing. So it, it doesn't look, mm. you know, too bad. Uh, but it had a definite um, one of a kind feel to it that I think some people really were drawn to. Yeah. I mean, I think at, since I've started collecting custom knives, it's, it's fixed blades and, you know, I've, I've all sorts of knives, but uh, those are the most special to me because I've met a lot of the people who've made them and, and it means something, uh, that part, but also the knowing that no two are exactly the same mm -hmm. is, is exciting. Uh, before we go uh, on, uh, let's not leave people wondering, do you have any knives around you to, that you can show as examples? I do. I have a, it's one I actually made on my YouTube oh. and it's a canister Damascus core. So it's ball bearings with some uh, powdered steel and then it's Oops, stainless a little sand mai. Sorry. There we go. Stainless sand mai. That's not yeah. something we hear often. Yeah, no, it's 303 stainless on the, uh, for the cladding. Oh. So if you're just listening, you can see the, um, the black, a cutting edge steel and and the core when you turn it sideways on its spine. This is like a double edged fighter. Is that a is that a sharpened swedge or is that a false edge there? That's a false edge. This thing is beautiful. What what? Uh, tell me about the handle there. Uh, the handle is a piece of uh, what was it? Uh, maple burl. 
So it's it, spalting w- in there. Would you say that this is representative of uh, the kind of knives you like to make, or do you have a very wide? Uh, what's your repertoire? Um, that's I really like making the uh, the Bowie knives, uh, but I also like making oh. folders. I don't make them very often, um, but this one is actually this one's my wife's. It has my second piece of titanium Damascus I ever made on the handle. Wow. And then the blade is actually, uh, I forged that too. It's CPM3B for the core and then stainless Damascus for the cladding. What? That, wait, can you uh, please hold that one up a little bit closer too? Just yeah. so we can... Look at that. Oh, yeah. It's a little that... dull because it's been carry and used for a couple of years so i gotta say it's it's very uh interesting to me that you just pulled that out and opened it and it looks like it's got beautiful action and it's not something you make often that's kind of a man that's a huge flex because uh making folders i know is a is a different game i'm not saying that forging blades isn't complex but it's a different kind of engineering um (laughs) Is that uh, how did you learn that? Is this, uh, and then we'll get back to your forging, but that's a little surprising to me. Um, I watched a couple videos on YouTube. Uh, he, I don't think this, I don't think he makes knives anymore, but he was, uh, he went by, I think, Ecom Knives, and he had some great, uh, folder tutorials. Um, and I just kind of followed some of his, you know, videos. It, it took me at least a dozen to get a decent folding knife. Um, but the reason I don't do more of them, and I actually plan to do more in the future, uh, really has just been because I've been so busy. Okay. Well, okay. Let's, uh, for, uh, let's talk about your process. I, I also think it's really cool to have a forged blade with like that amazing steel on mm-hmm. a folder. Uh, but let's talk about your, your general process, uh, um, forging. Uh, how did you get into forging? Um, tell me about that. Um, really i think it was seeing some of the like really beautiful like forged knives on instagram um seeing some of like i think it uh, one of the first makers i found on instagram was like jay nielsen Mm. he does some incredible forged work and i was like yeah i i really want to do that and then i started seeing um you know other makers do things that like almost no one else was doing uh like one of them was like rad knives he made these cleavers and he uh, pattern welded his own uh, titanium, which I was like, you know, I, I got to figure out how to do that too. And so I just started like side projects of learning, you know, these are the materials I want to learn to make. I'm going to buy a bunch of, you know, steel and just start learning and testing and breaking things. And uh, in the course of the last, you know, seven years, I've figured a lot of it out. Um, I still like to break stuff, you know, make sure that things are where I want. But um, it's a lot of testing, a lot of trial and error. So basically self-taught in the forge uh, by watching other people mm-hmm. work. Like, uh, so I, I had the opportunity at the at the Texas Custom Knife Show this past November to watch Jay Nielsen uh, do a, a, a canister Damascus mm. live. And it was very cool to watch. And he was he was he was uh, funny and. Uh, you know, really knew how to work the crowd, work the room yeah. while he's doing it. Um, but it seems like a, a fascinating uh, process to me. Uh, all those different kind of Damascus. Uh, mm-hmm. how, how how have you explored that? What do you? What process do you like best there? I don't know if I have a process that I like best. Um, canister is really fun to do because you can take like you know if you have like cutoffs of damascus you can clean those up i like to use a sandblaster just because it removes all of the scale and you can toss those into canister with some ball bearings and some powdered steel and uh, you can get some really intricate and strange patterns out of that um but i I really like stainless sand mine that's another thing that when i started seeing you know some of the first stainless sand my blades i was like wow you know that kind of contrast is incredible and Contrast is something I really do enjoy. Uh, and so figuring out how to do, you know, stainless sand mai was uh, probably like, I think the first really difficult uh, material I learned to forge weld after just normal Damascus. 
And for me, it was always just kind of like figuring out the process. And uh, generally, it took me many failed billets that ended up in the you know the the, the scrap bucket. Um, but you know, eventually, I did figure out how to you know make the stainless Damascus and what was you know the best way to make it. And even now, I still you still get the occasional billet that just will not forge weld and. Uh, Failure is an interesting thing to me. I like to know like where things fail, why they fail, and lets me figure out how to make them fail less in the future. Yeah, yeah, it gets you to move on and progress. Yeah. Uh, what What are the challenges like? Um, I, I I know that um, stainless Damascus is like is not something easy. Forging stainless, what I don't get it. Can you? Uh, can you explain? Yeah. <laughs> can you forge stainless? I mean, I guess you can. Oh yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. I actually, uh, I forged stainless a couple times. It's not fun. Um, the difference is like when when you're forging high carbon steels, you get them up to that good forging temperature, and you start, you know, you can hit them with the hammer. They move uh, kind of like really tough clay, or like kind of like a like a stiff wax. Mm -hmm. um, stainless is at least four or five times harder you can mm. if you're not right at the right temperature it's not going to move at all um and the temperature window for stainless um is a lot slimmer so like with high carbon steel you're forging it it's going to forge really well from like 1800 degrees which is like you know a, like a high orange color a bright orange it's going to move really well up into like 2200 past that you risk burning it uh, but it's gonna move really well in that 400 degree window with uh with stainless steel you're like right at 2000 and you really gotta oh. stay within 100 degrees on each side or any hotter it'll start to fall apart any cooler and it's just not gonna move literally it will fall apart if it gets hot. yeah yeah i actually had a couple of the, the first stainless damascus billet i made i got it up a little too hot it was like 2250 2300 and i hit it with a hammer and it just was sparks all <laughs> over the shop wow yeah that's these little tiny pieces I, I i i might be mistaken but i don't remember ever talking with someone who uh forges stainless i i'm i'm sure i must have mm -hmm. uh but it seems somewhat rare because it it does seem like a something that has a huge learning curve and uh, you, you probably waste a lot of stainless or you don't waste it, but it doesn't turn into yeah. knives. It turns into knowledge. Yep. Yeah. I, another thing about stainless is it cools at a different rate during the quench as the high carbon. Um, and it shrinks a little bit more. And so if you don't have like the correct geometry before heat treat, it'll actually like peel itself like open and uh, not necessarily it won't break the weld between the high carbon and the stainless it'll break the high carbon and so it'll just like peel open and it's the strangest thing um but it's why see, like on this knife when i heat treated it originally the whole spine i ground in a false edge and that helps to uh prevent the stainless from pulling so hard on the high carbon spine. Oh, um, I ground that part off up here, but it's, it's a very tricky material to work with. And like, uh, recently I'm actually still working on a, uh, it's a Damascus core stainless sand my katana. And it took me uh, like three blades to get one that finally actually worked exactly how I wanted. So you're saying on the knife you're just holding up uh, that false edge uh, in cross section like this uh, reduces the amount of stainless that's going all the way up to the yeah. spine and that mm -hmm. reduces the tension pulling back. Yeah. Yep. That's crazy. Okay. So when you're quenching uh, a, a blade that is a combination of stainless and high carbon, do you do it in oil or do you do yeah. it in the, okay. Cause when you do the straight up stainless, you're putting it, between plates right and a yep. foil wrap and all that yeah huh. and even with the with actually with all my blades i do them after 
quench in the oil, I take them and I clamp them in between the aluminum plates just because it keeps them very straight. Uh, but with the, with the high carbon core, you, you do have to quench in oil because you got to get the, the core steel nice and hard. Okay, uh, hold that up again. I mean, you, and, and, and put it real close to the camera because that, yeah, those waves in the blade, you can see other... So uh, the high carbon itself, is that one high carbon steel or is that a couple? Oh, uh, well, it's 52100 ball bearings. Uh -huh. And then oh. the steel in between that is, it's like a 1084 with 4% nickel. Okay, so, it gives so that's, it the, yeah. Gives it the contrast in the core steel. And then you have the bright and shiny stainless jacket. And this is a non-hardening stainless, so it, it's very tough. It's 303 stainless, uh, but it doesn't get very hard. Okay, so I'm, I'm interested. You were talking about, um, you know, um, you were incidentally saying you're very busy, so you have a hard time, uh, you know, doing a lot of any one thing like the folders. or So yeah. uh, tell us a little bit about your design process, how you go about designing knives and and what you're making. Are you constantly filling orders or are you um, experimenting with different blades? For the last like three years, I've been constantly filling orders. Uh, before that, I did a lot of experimenting and now I'm trying to get back to doing a lot more experimenting. Uh, but the last two or three years, I've been very booked and I don't like letting my books run out too long. So uh, when, when I get really booked, I will just make a whole bunch of knives and uh, and kind of like not stop the experimenting, but, you know, pause things. I'll start planning projects for the future. Um, and then, you know, when I have free time, I'll go ahead and actually I'll start trying out some of the, the new processes that I've thought about. So uh, to, to me, that's pretty interesting. Well, first of all, I love these, uh, the coffin uh, handle buoys are beautiful. Mm. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I mean they're all beautiful, but those resonate a lot because that's probably my favorite, you know, favorite knife of all time is the buoy. Mm -hmm. uh, depends on what day you ask me. Uh, any anyway, yeah. um, uh, where was I going with that? Oh, uh, just in the variety of what you make, uh, Jim was scrolling these, mm -hmm. uh, and he was showing um, swords, wakizashis, mm. kind of modernized uh, katanas, wakizashis. I, I even saw something, a cruciform sort of, uh, you know, crusader's sword. Mm -hmm. um, how did you move into swords and what's your fascination with swords? Well, I actually, uh, I started doing swords about the same time that I started learning, teaching myself how to do folders. Um, and I don't know why I made this post on like Instagram. It was like five years ago. And I was like, big or small, I want to make them all. And <laughs> after I started making folders and swords, I was like, you know, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of lessons that I can take from a really small piece and I can apply them to a really big piece. And uh, I just kind of, there's processes from both swords and even like, uh, like folding knives that you can you can apply the lesson in both places and I, I thought i found that really beneficial so i just continued making both of them i actually have two swords uh, oh, with me let us see them yeah so this one is another this one belongs to my wife oh sorry for if you're just listening and you hear me breathing heavy this is beautiful it looks like a sort of a viking yeah sword double-edged long fuller all the way down um not super pointy tip and then it looks like sort of a five lobed five lobed pommel yeah similar to it oh it's beautiful yeah this one's a full tang yeah so so this is your wife's sword that's pretty yeah. cool that is i think I don't remember what it was for, but it was it was a gift several years ago. For my shield maiden. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She, actually, she has like four or five of my knives. Oh, cool. And then I have this one's more tactical. And this one is a uh, katana. Oh. 
Look at that. And this one's CPM 3V. So did you forge this? Do you forge 3V or is this something that you uh, do stock removal of? Um, um, I try to do stock removal whenever I can, but uh, when you're making a, this long of a blade, I do have to forge in the, uh, the tang that runs through the handle. Uh, wow. And is this, uh, so to get that curve, is that something in the cooling of it? Um, if you're heat treating in water, you don't have to, uh, forge in the curvature. The, the, the water is harsh enough that if your blade survives, it will take <laughs> yeah. that curve. Uh, if you're heat treating in oil, you do have to forge it in. Uh, you'll actually lose curvature in an oil quench. Um, this, these guys are, this is an air hardening. I do an aluminum plate quench on these. So I do have to forge the curvature in on these guys too. And that blade is, uh, well, no, wait, don't, don't put it away quite yet. So uh, the blade has a really nice curve to it. And it, man, the, the polish looks gorgeous. You've got that secondary tip, kind of like an Americanized yep. Tonto. The Suba is sort of modern looking. It's a very sort of modern looking handle and guard. I, I love it. And and is this also uh, full tang? Oh, this one's not full tang. This one is, it's like a near full tang. It goes out to about here. Oh, right, uh, right. But I've okay. encased it in G10. All right, right. That's kind of what I was thinking. I, I didn't mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I got that. That's cool. That is a beauty, and I like its modernness. Yeah, the, the modern uh, aspect, but it it also has uh, the the real classic look. So, is this the knife that you're raffling, or is this the sword that you're raffling? No, this is one of them. One of them. Okay. And it has a matching wakizashi. Love that wakizashi. So, yeah, I, I was. Uh, if you go to the to the Charles Jones Blades website, you'll see a pop, well, not a pop up, but the, the landing page uh, is a raffle for those two swords. And uh, just go check it out. It's a very reasonable uh, spot uh, price, especially for what you would get if you were to win. Oh my God. So uh, <laughs> you were talking about history before and, and your fascination with how people did things in the past. Mm -hmm. And here you're making these knives and swords that are very obviously uh, based on historical uh, knives and swords. And yet you're using a blend of how people did things in the past and modern processes. How, how does that uh, balance out for you? I, I think it works really well. Um... I think there's a lot of lessons in the past and just even just styles in the past that are really just beautiful and alluring. And I like to bring a little bit of the past and into the future and uh, kind of mix the two. I think it works really well. Uh, your coffin shaped uh, coffin handled buoy has a, a um, an overall very classic uh, profile, mm -hmm. you know, of a, of a buoy with the, with that shaped handle. But then when you look at it and, and the scales and the way the scales uh, and the guard come up on in the Ricasso, that whole area, mm -hmm. it looks very modern to me. Yeah. And I, and I'm thinking right now of the one with the walnut handles on your website. Mm. Uh, it's a little bit harder to see with the black and black G10. Uh, but to me, that, that little area is uh, of that blade is what makes that a modern kind of special and different uh Bowie knife. Uh, how does that work into your designing? Um, sometimes it's just that, like, I'll be watching a movie and I just see, like, you know, oh, wow, that's a cool knife. And I'm like, you know, I want to make something kind of similar to that. So I, you know, pull out some paper and I start drawing up some things and erasing a lot. And then I'm left with, you know, a, a design that I can take out in the shop and give it a try. And uh, usually when I'm kind of designing something new i'll make like two or three sometimes even more versions um, that have slight changes to them hmm. and just see like which one i like better uh it's funny because uh, uh part of my uh other job is editing video i produce mm. uh video and um it's very easy to do three different versions when you're <laughs> non-linear editing yeah. like i'm gonna do three versions of this and 
see how they look. Yeah. Uh, not so easy, I would imagine, when you're when you're doing uh, this kind of work. Uh, it does. Do you find it hard to to make things replicable and um, the same every time? Um, it's definitely more difficult than making a unique piece every time. Uh, I, I try to make things as close as possible. I, I do have. Uh, I made a set of like master stencils out of G10 because it works really well and it's you know, fairly affordable. The really thin stuff, um, and then you know I just scribe off of those, and that's actually that's how I designed all of my folding knives. That's how I got all the parts that fit in here because this one, the uh, the stop pin, is totally under the scale, right next to the pivot. And I actually made this knife in G10 before I made it in, you know, a more difficult, expensive material. It lets me see where the blade stops, where the stop pin holes need to be. And, you know, I mean, that's it's like $10 in G10. And it's way easier to work. You can just, you know, a little file and it just files beautifully. And you can work out most of your issues if you make something in like G10 or even just like thin wood for you you know, go into the, the metals part. Uh, how about the lock and, and all of that? Can you work any of that out uh, without the metal? You could. Um, I generally don't, uh, but you definitely could. G10, if you heat it up a little bit and you bend it, it'll totally take the shape that you bend it to. So you could make a fully functional. Uh, the only thing is the detent ball. Uh, It'd be a little hard to get it to stick, but we probably could. All right. I want to get back to what I was talking before about uh, the past and your fascination with how people did things in the past. What I was getting at with my question was, do you see yourself using um, any techniques or processes from the past um, because that's what they are um, when you could be using a more streamlined thing or, or is it is it not like that? Um, I mean, I, I try to streamline things as, as much as I can to make it, you know, a little easier on myself, but some things in the past, like, like something I've been wanting to do for a really long time is, uh, actually like make my own steel from scratch. I go from, from ore into like bloomery steel. Um, and yeah, it's a lot more difficult than working with just a standard modern steel. that's all homogenized and all that, but, uh, I think there's a lot of a lot of things you can learn in trying some of the old original methods, and uh, I think there's a level of beauty there that you don't quite get nowadays. Uh, something I've recently started doing is uh, using like old wrought iron on some pieces to uh, forge out. Like there's a sword that I'm working on that has a, a wrought iron guard that I forged and. Forging wrought iron is, is quite an interesting material. It's definitely different than just about any modern material. I have one knife with wrought iron on it. It's a, it's a sub hilt fighter and mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's the guard and the, and the sub hilt. And it was taken from an old bridge in Boston, which is kind of a cool, little, That's cool. Uh, uh, side note. But uh, yeah, I, I heard from the gentleman who made that knife uh, that the wrought iron is, is not really a walk in the park. No, no, it's uh, it really is almost like a composite material. It's strands of uh, of iron and, and steel. It's kind of like mishmashed and pressed together, and there's some inclusions in there. And uh, you have to work it really hot, or it, like all those little strands will break out and spread apart. It's some very interesting material to make or to to work with. I mean, to me, that sounds like uh, uh, the a, a microscopic version or a very small version of when you see on Forged in Fire, um, guys making. I mean, that's 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 my Ooh. reference point anyway. Yeah. Guys, guys making uh, a cable Damascus and pounding on the cable and then seeing you know bits of it popping out. God, that's got to be frustrating as hell. Yeah, I, I, I bet it's very similar. I've never worked with. I've never done cable Damascus, but. I, from seeing it, I, I think they're probably really similar. So as Jim was just uh, scrolling on your page, I saw beautiful sax. Uh, you do some sort of modern saxes. Uh, I saw mm -hmm. what I think was a war hammer, uh, yeah. some swords. Um, what, what are your favorite, um, um, 
periods of history and what swords or weapons from history do you hope to make that you haven't made yet? I really, I really enjoy the like, like late migration era. So like, uh, be six or 700 AD getting into like, you know, the Viking era. I really like saxes, um, just because they're just a very, I don't know, a very cool, just overall blade shape. Like you can still see like the, the, the original sax blade shape in a lot of, uh, the lockback knives. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I think that that's really cool. I, I like uh, making big versions. I actually have of this guy that I'm working on now. He's not done. But this is uh, oh god, that's beautiful. The sax. Okay, hold that up a little higher and a little closer. Look at the steel on that. That looks like a river running through. Uh, like a, it looks like a fjord from from space or something. Yeah. God, that that's something. And the handle. I'm really liking the shape of this handle. It's, is it going to be sort of a coffiny? Uh, is it going to maintain that shape? Yeah. And it is going to have a uh, uh, probably a copper uh, ferrule here, guard. Um, but yeah, the handle is maple. So it uh, it has a lot of figure hiding under there. It's still really rough right now. But uh, yeah, I just I just like the, those old, old shapes. All right. If you don't mind, hold that up. And if you have a buoy, hold that up. Uh, because when I'm looking at a broke back sax, I'm like, that is not really different from a Bowie. And then I no, see they're very similar. So what, as a man who makes both, like, what are the differences? Um, I think the differences really are like on, on, on Bowie's, you'll often see a little bit of recurve right here right at the bit like right you know has a little bit of a belly and a little bit of a recurve in here but really the tip profile is very similar on both and i think part of that just comes from uh, like how like the united states of america was uh, kind of we just mixed everything you know mm. like 50 or 60 cultures from across the world, you throw everybody together and people make things over, you know, the course of 300 years and things just kind of, they just mix and influence each other. And I kind of think that that's where, where you get to you know, this blade shape showing up kind of everywhere. Yeah. But this is actually taken out of, uh, it's a, uh, He's the guy who did the typology on like European swords. His name is like Ewart Oakshot. Uh, he did a book uh, that's all like Viking pieces. And this is a copy of the blade shape of a grave find, I think, in France from like 700. That's amazing. You know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, you hear about, uh, I can never remember the name of the Viking swords that were so prized uh, among every, uh, you know, way above everything else mm. and how a lot of Viking swords were, you know, I don't, I don't want to put it this way, but like garbage or uh, not mm. very good. And then some of them yeah. were absolutely spectacular. There didn't seem to be much of a middle ground. Yeah. The, the, the Ulf, Ulfbert swords. Yes. Ulfbert. Yeah, yeah. 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 Those are interesting. Some of them actually, uh, I've seen some of the, uh, like more scientific research into the steel and some of them are uh, like crucible steel that, that some historians think of that may have been, you know, traded on the silk road that came from India all the way up into like Denmark, you know, Northern what's now Northern Germany, like into Scandinavia. And uh, the Smiths turned them into swords up there. And then some of them are just, you know, pattern welded, essentially like wrought iron swords yeah yeah right that's what i've heard kind of like mm -hmm. um and then and now to know what what it looks like on that microscopic level it's like yeah. celery you know with mm -hmm. all the long strands yep um uh, so i think it's interesting you know the uh you mentioned that you love the nordic or or 
uh, what did you say, from the 600s, uh, those uh, swords in Europe, but also you have a, you seem to have a real uh, affinity for Japanese swords. Where does that come from? I don't know if that really comes from any one place. Um, I think it's just an admiration of like the culture of like the Japanese sword. Because, like, I have watched several documentaries on some of their master swordsmiths spending, like, one whole month making, you know, a single blade. And, and just the, the fact that, that they made the steel with the iron sand, you get the tomahogane, and you're able to forge a sword out of that. It's just always been quite incredible to me. And I think the styling in, uh, in, in some of those swords is just incredible. And I also like the use of, like, you know, copper and brass and uh ray skin is, is a really cool material to work with um so i just overall just really really admire that uh that genre of sword you mentioned the ray skin i'm a huge mm -hmm. fan of the sukamaki wrap on yeah. modern blades on mm -hmm. you know I, I have a lot of uh edc fixed blades and a, a few of them have very nicely japanese wrapped handles and that uh when done properly um and and i have my own ideas of what properly means but uh to me that the wrap has to kind of fold over to create a high peak yeah and and what makes it really effective are those alternating peaks and valleys that mm -hmm. you're you're the fat of your palm and then your fingers can sink into and it's a really yeah. great grip even without a guard mm -hmm. yeah i've done a couple of those um i i like the 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 really modern ones that are that are done with the the cordless paracord oh, you yeah. can get it really tight and it almost is like uh it's almost as hard as like you know the wood underneath but it does give you that uh, that, that kind of just the grip texture i think is really cool so what is your most uh, popular uh kind of blades what what do you sell the most of um i sell a lot of uh tactical blades um uh, don't really have a blade shape that's most popular but people seem to really like the uh the more tactical knives but uh anytime i make something that's pattern welded that one tends to to sell pretty quick too so so is your model like you you um so do you make some things that you just kind of make and then say hey i just made this who wants yeah. it Okay, and then other other stuff you have custom orders. Some guys like I want it all black combat yeah. sacks. For yeah, how how I, how I usually do it is is I'll take some time, I'll design a knife, I'll make you know two or three that are kind of similar. I'll put those ones up for sale as like you know available, and then uh, you know if I really enjoyed making that knife, then I'll put that design on like my website or my Etsy where you can order one because you know I enjoyed making it. I'd like to make one again, and. Uh, it seems to be the the more like darker colors uh muted hamones they're not muted but like the the darker hamone the the mm. the really high contrast hamone seem to be quite popular too what's that oh that's your uh your uh statement there uh so in terms of business you started the company as a business business in 2017 mm -hmm. is that right yeah uh, so how has that been? I mean, we know you've been making knives since you were 12 or that's when the first one, mm -hmm. uh, but that's very different from, you know, being a hobbyist is very different from running and owning a business. What's the business part been like? Uh, what's the learning curve and that kind of, that kind of thing? Well, uh, the business is definitely, the business part of it is, is definitely challenging. Uh, I was always really entrepreneurial as a kid, uh, in, in middle school, I, uh, actually got kind of well known for it um but i would i would buy like energy drinks and fruit snacks in bulk at like costco <laughs> and i'd smuggle them into the school and i'd sell them and you know it, it made me like you know 100 bucks a week or so which I mean, back in you know 2007 was decent money um so i always had that like business mindset and uh and then after that uh it's after after i got out of high school um, I did a computer repair and Xbox 360 repair business. I did custom Xboxes for like three years. And then after that, you know, I really was like, oh, well, you know, 
the Xbox 360 is going away, so I should probably, you know, get a real job. And that's when I started doing the over the phone work and working for, you know, the, the man. And then, yeah. But, but really, running my own business is always something I really enjoyed, even though it's uh, definitely harder than just having a normal job. There's a level of uh, freedom and decision making and like what direction you want to go in that is really rewarding. Yeah. And, 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 uh, as a non-business owner, from my perspective, it seems like, uh, that aspect of it balances out the, the gut grinding aspect of it. I'm sure there, there are some of those, like, um, I always think of restaurants as the most nerve wracking business to own because how much food do we get? We can't get too much, can't get too little. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what you don't use spoils. Luckily what you don't use doesn't spoil, but that doesn't make it any easier. Uh, you know, hoeing a, hoeing a row, so to speak, as a as a knife maker is doesn't seem um, easy. What um, in terms of uh, marketing and getting your name out there, is it social media? It's definitely it, social media. Um, when I first started to, you know, had decided that, you know, I'm going to make this, you know, at least like a little bit of a you know side business, I. Uh, uh, my wife was doing an herbal fair and so i made some like little garden knives as some of the first blades that i made and those were the ones i took to the herbal fair and started posting those on uh on instagram and facebook and people really seemed to like them and so i was like okay i gotta i gotta embrace the new world and get on instagram and facebook and youtube and just kind of get myself out there but that, that's been quite a trip so uh, you said an herbal fair. I'm I'm presuming mm-hmm. that's like a like a like a gardening market, like a farmer's yeah. market or something like that. Yeah, it was it was like handcrafted goods. You, you could buy like you know bulk herbs, uh, like starter plants. Like you go and buy a bunch of tomato starts. Uh, but there's a lot of art there too. So, is your wife an artist or an, uh, a a grower or? Um, a little bit of everything. Uh, we have four kids and soon to be five so we're all awesome. a little busy but yeah. uh but she she was doing like like copper wrap jewelry at the time uh still does some but she just does a little bit of everything so have your children shown an interest in knives in your process in your shop um yeah, a few of them uh my my youngest son the shop is one of his favorite places he will come in <laughs> When I'm, you know, taking a break, he'll be like, "Dad, can I drill a hole?" <laughs> I'll take him over to the drill press and let him drill a hole in a piece of wood, and he's always so tickled. Um, uh, my older boys are, you know, a little more interested in video games right now, but uh, they they they're very tech minded, which you know I was at that age too. Mm-hmm. Um, but they they all think it's really cool, and uh, even my oldest son will come out and hand sand with me in the shop sometimes, so. That's that's been really cool. I, I like that. Uh, just the thought of uh, my daughter actually used to do that with my drill press, which Ooh. I've since moved. But she eh, can I just drill, you know? Yeah. And she, and she loved it. And and there's not not much to it, but just showing that you can do stuff like that, mm-hmm. I think is a really good example. And and I'm not saying me with my drilling skills. I'm saying you with your shop and and your ability to take something very elemental and turn it into something beautiful and useful. What, what are your end goals for your knives? What do you hope, uh, you know, how do you hope your knives impact the world? I just like the idea of making something that's going to, you know, outlive me by a long time. Um, I think I've made probably close to 1500, maybe 2000 knives. And, uh, and I hope to someday, you know, get 10,000 or so out there. But uh, I really just want to do a lot more artistic stuff and a lot more like folding knives and just some, some things that have been a real deep interest of mine for the last few years. So uh, you uh, have any advice that you would give someone who might think uh, knife making is for them? Um. My advice would be to have a good backup plan, uh, but also spoken like are, a dad. <laughs> if you are going to, you know, uh, 
really pursue knife making as like a job, uh, be prepared to fail a lot and, and learn from it and practice patience because sometimes uh, you're trying to make something and it fails 10 times and uh, you have to walk away without, you know, breaking anything, <laughs> you know, yeah. throwing it in the, in the trash bin a little too hard. Um, but yeah, just perseverance would be my uh, recommendation. So are we going to see you at blade show or how, if not, how do people catch up with you? What's the best way to get in touch with you? Uh, best way probably is through my Instagram or Facebook. Um, on my website, there's also a, you know, you can send me an email through there. Uh, this year, probably not, not going to be a blade show. I do hope to go next year, but uh, this year we'll have a little baby. So I won't be able to make Oh it. yeah. Yeah. You did just mention yeah. that. But, um, but yeah, no, next year, I definitely am going to try to, to make it to at least one of the blade shows. Oh, that'd be awesome. It'd be great to meet you in person and, and check out your blades, but, uh, you don't have to wait till Charles is at blade show to check out his blades, uh, check them out on Instagram and, uh, on your website. And I, I have to say, uh, from a collector's standpoint, um, especially someone who likes, um, historical weapons and such, uh, one thing I appreciate about appreciate about your work is not only the work itself not only is it beautiful and seems like incredibly well made especially Thank you. reading about your process and seeing your work and mm -hmm. hearing you talk about it uh but also um there's you know if 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 you want to go real deep and get something super intricate and pricey you can you can do that if you want to stay uh, a little more simple and a little more um you know value minded you have some knives that are within mm -hmm. reach uh and i really appreciate that um as i'm sure anyone who goes to your website and checks it out will too so um anyway charles jones of charles jones blades thank you so much yeah, for you. coming on the knife junkie podcast i appreciate it There it goes, ladies and gentlemen, Charles Jones of Charles Jones Blades. You like buoys? You like wakizashis? Do you like uh, a really cool kukri that he does custom? Uh, definitely go check out uh, Charles Jones Blades uh, at the website or on Instagram. Uh, do check us out again next Sunday for another great conversation and on Wednesday for the midweek supplemental and, of course, Thursday for Thursday Night Knives. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast